Hey everybody, it's me, John Anthony Chihak Soltero. I am the anti-hero and here today with another mail call um, from Collector's Haven. Now, picked up quite a few books, um, good sized stacks from all three shows, Andy, Dash, and um, Sarah, and Anthony. They, they call it the Anthony Show, but Sarah is his wife, and she keeps track of all the comments and um, asks all the questions and stuff like that for people watching. So it's to me, it's the Sarah and Anthony show. Um, so I kind of divided them because this was one stack by itself. So here we go. Oh, this is from the, the ton of birds of prey that I bought. So I got a bunch of Ed Bennis birds of prey. Uh, this is not a Bennis cover, however, that is also not a Bennis cover, but I know some people who love Birds of Prey. So this is a great run, Birds of Prey. Let me actually just kind of go through this. Is all of this Birds of Prey? Yeah, this is all Birds of Prey. Some of these covers are really great. Like, here we go. All new Birds of Prey, Black Canary and Batgirl. Um, then, this is not a Bennis cover, but this is, I guess they get a new office building. Um, Bennett, is that Joe Bennett? It's Joe Bennett, but here we go with um, Bennis. Gail Simone and Ed Bennis may have had the best run on Birds of Prey. It was a lot of fun. I mean, the women were drawn exceptionally well. The characters were written exceptionally well. Uh, this one, the one year later, number 93, with the uh, Dodson artwork on the cover. And then continuing that. They actually just uh, messaged me today because I sent um, the Collector's Haven team um, a whole bunch of stuff uh, on my pull list to complete different things like Alpha Flight. Uh, they pulled five more issues of Nightwing, the original run for me. So that's going to have me um, uh, with quite a few, um, uh, quite a few, um, quite a few less holes to fill. All right. Oh, cool. Married with Children, number one, photo cover. It's also a newsstand, too, so that's cool. Uh, Mad Magazine, this is a Reap the Millennium edition of issue number one, which is kind of cool. Errana. That's issue 11, issue 5. This is a great cover. I have this series, but this is a, I'm trying to remember which variant this is, but this is nine volt. This is kind of like um, Ex Machina, uh, before Ex Machina, um, the, the movie with the AI. This is a great Scott Collins, Mightiest Avengers, or Earth's Mightiest Heroes, um, great She-Hulk cover. Of course, She-Hulk is super, super hot right now, except uh, something that was kind of a term coined by um, uh, people who watched um, Jim Ballant, uh, Ballant's artwork, boob socks. Like, sorry, fellas, boob, boobs don't fit into clothing like that. It's Berserker number one. God. Blank cover, and then the A cover, uh, the Mark Brooks cover. Finally broke down and bought it. Um, I've heard good things about, about you know, Keanu Reeves has been a fan of comic books for a really long time. And um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of celebrities getting involved in comics. I, I hate when celebrities get involved in comics. I'm not saying you can't be a comic book fan and be a celebrity, but 
So my beef with celebrities, uh, actors, uh, musicians, uh, I mean, Nick Cage got involved with comics where he co-created a book with his son. Um, Tyrese was the creator of a comic book. I don't even remember what the name of it was, but I flipped through it and it was just god awful. It was like, this was done in the mid aughts, like the mid to late aughts. So like 07, 08, 09. And this book looked, looked, looked like it was drawn in 92. Like it looked like it was an image book. There were no backgrounds. It was just like super extreme uh, type of look. And when you looked in the credits, uh, Tyrese had absolutely nothing to do with it. Like, I guess it was based on a concept or the character was based on him or something like that. And I'm like, maybe he's a comic book fan, but like, why is, why is he involved? Um, Alyssa Milano did one that was like Hacktivity or the Hacktivist or something, it, some other weird thing. Um, I think she was like a writer on it. And I mean, to be fair, at least Alyssa Milano's kind of been really under the radar. Um, J.J. Abrams getting in and, and writing, you know, Spider-Man. Um, you know, same thing with Joss Whedon, you know, I'm just not a fan of that. I don't think, you know, he's a good storyteller to begin with. Um, and then Keanu Reeves, and I'm just like, you know, here we go. Um, you know, it's just another celebrity. And and here's the thing, you don't cash in on comics. Like, I, I don't get why somebody who's making, you know, movies and, you know, getting million dollar paychecks or what have you would want to lower themselves to you know, write or draw a comic book. It, none of them draw it, that's for sure. Um, you know, the time it takes to draw a comic book, at least for me, because I have a full-time job, and for the most part, I do I, I do it 100% myself. Creating a comic book could take me the same amount of time that it takes somebody to shoot a movie. Um, and, and that's not feasible for a lot of people. But if you really cut it down into the actual hours that I spend doing it, you know, it, it maybe takes the same time or less or, you know, what have you. Um, so that's kind of one of those things that it just bothers me. It feels like a quick cash in and it feels dishonest and it feels like somebody trying to take glory away from somebody else. Um, you know, it's kind of like when big name actors start voice acting. It's the same issue I have. Like there are people who have been doing voice acting their entire careers or become known for voice acting more so than their their actual acting roles. And to have people come in who are known actors and actresses and just start voicing these characters, it's, to me, it's insulting as somebody who, you know, did the deed and went through animation and, and got a, um, you know, got a degree and, and is creating comic books that will hopefully one of these days somebody will take an interest in to, um, you know, if I market it right, turn it into an animated series or an action figure line or a plushie line. Um, but until that time, I'm good doing it this way because I have 100% creative control. I'm not harshing in on anybody else's territory by doing this because I'm actually putting in the work. Um, the only thing I really, really would like to do, and it wouldn't even necessarily be an acting role, although, you know, it would be cool. Uh, once they do decide to do that Nightwing movie, I want to be a part of it. I don't care if I'm a grip, I'm holding the boom mic, I don't care if I'm, you know, just watching the catering table. I just want to be a part of it because Nightwing is my favorite character. And if, because um, I got the tattoo on my leg, I mean, I could be a corpse that, you know, he sees early on and he sees the tattoo and he's just like, that's a good design. I'll use that. I mean, I'd be good with that. I'd be good with just being like, you know, it just being my knee to my foot, like just on camera and he sees it and that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it does bother me when, when people come in from, you know, other, other areas and it's, it's not really their gig. And I feel like it's an invasion on, on something that's very personal to me and I, you know, something I've been working on for 15 years now. My first book came out in June of 2006. 
Uh, and so we're coming up on 15 years of me creating comic books. And even before that was me, you know, writing scripts and laying stuff out all the way back into the late 90s. So it's not like it came easy. It's not like it just happened. And believe me, those first 10 years of doing comics were, were bad. I mean, like I look back at that artwork and I have stacks of books that I, I almost don't want to sell to people because they're not good. <laughs> But, you know, when you're only putting out one or two books a year, it, it takes you time to get your rhythm and your balance and your storytelling. And that's why doing something on a monthly basis or putting out like a big size graphic novel every year is really, really important for the creative process of making comics because you learn as you go. There, there's no substitute to learning as you go. It's kind of like being a professional wrestler. Like, you can be in great cardio shape. You can know how to take bumps and do high spots and throw a great suplex. But you're never going to be a, a phenomenal wrestler or even a good, solid, sturdy wrestler without performing in the ring, hitting the ropes every night, and performing in front of a crowd or in front of a handful of people as you build yourself up. Same thing being a, a music performer. You need to perform live in front of people in order to get that. It's a little different with comic books. So uh, with comic books, it's it's fighting under deadline. It's, you know, not having an ego about having to change something because you have editors or because the, the publisher wants you to do it a certain way. Um, or, you know, it's not your IP. You don't get to control the direction. That's why I do it my way. Like I used to want to work for Marvel. I used to want my characters to be part of the X-Men. And then I started to think about it. And I'm like, I don't want somebody to have control over my characters. I want to be able to decide their destiny and their path. And so then the goal was to get to San Diego Comic-Con. And then I realized that was going to be kind of hard. And I started thinking like, I'll get swallowed up whole here, um, which was probably actually self-defeating, but a very smart thought process for euthanasia because euthanasia was so niche and so unpolished, um, it, it was it was very unprofessional. And it, that I can look at that now, and I can say that was you know with a straight face without getting upset. That it would have gotten just totally, you know, swept under the rug. Nobody would have cared. Um, I do believe, and I do know that with the Bubba Patrol, there is marketability. It's colorful. It's bright. It's got a great story. The, the artwork is solid. The visual sequential storytelling is really, really good. And the characters are top notch and very heartfelt. And I'm getting that feedback from my editor. I'm getting that feedback from my colorist. He's looking at the pages as he's coloring them. And he's just like, your storytelling is getting better from issue to issue. Um, you can really tell like without the words, because he has the script, so he kind of knows how to like light things and, and give a little bit more uh, gravitas to the characters and, and how their shading is done and stuff like that. And he's uh, churning out some phenomenal pages, like these the colored pages coming back. I just wanted him to do flats. And he is producing some great, great work. And uh, Bill Simpson's going to deserve a huge chunk of credit for making issue four even better than issue three. And, uh, but just some of the comments coming back, he's just like, this This expression is hilarious when they're getting suited up, or you can see the moment where these characters connect. Um, and Bill's worked professionally. He's worked for Image, he's worked for Top Cow, he's worked for Extreme Studios, he worked for Marvel. Um, so he's, he's done it. Um, and, so to have somebody who's worked in those caliber um, through that gamut, especially during the, the mid to, yeah, the early to mid 90s, that was a heyday in comic books. So for somebody who worked in that time frame is really, really big for them to say, this is getting good. So anyways, back to this. So it's uh, uh, one through four Cyber Force set complete with, uh, let's see, number one doesn't have anything special, but number four has 
you know, the uh, embossed type uh, header and then has, you know, the foil enhancement. Uh, Destroyer Duck number five. Destroyer Duck number four. Destroyer Duck number three. Destroyer Duck number two. Ruby, this is number one. This is the Jim Lee uh, B cover. And then Ruby, number one. This is, I don't know if Mirka and Dolfo did cover. I don't think she did the cover because this doesn't look like her style. Um, but Mirka and Dolfo did the interiors of Ruby. So these are... Um, this is my haul from Collector's Haven and, you know, a sidetrack rant that started because I pick, finally picked up Berserker. Um, also, on my read list, brand new to my read list, is Ultra Mega. Ultra Mega is a book, a uh, kaiju book, uh, coming out from Image Comics, and it is amazing. Um, if you're into kaiju, if you're into monsters, if you're into uh, crazy government plots with respect to defending the world. Okay, so think of Pacific Rim, but instead of giant robots piloted by humans, those giants that fight the kaiju that show up are genetically modified humans who can grow to substantial size, you know, bigger than skyscrapers, and they're going toe to toe. Um, issue number one, these are like larger quasi prestige format books. They're square bound. Uh, they're about, uh, I believe issue one was $8 worth every penny. Colors are great. The artwork is quirky, but it fits. It shouldn't be really clean line superheroes. It's a little jagged. It's a little off kilter, but it's kind of a dark subject matter. But at the same time, there's a lot of fun with it. But believe me, this is a very, very dark book. The concept is fun. The, uh, the outcome is very, very dark. Um, so definitely check that out. I'm going to be doing a, a review of Bitter Root. Um, and I will also do a review of the first issue of Home from Image Comics. So getting some of my indie goodness on and hope you are as well because I'm indie, so I got to support indie. I got to stop plugging money into DC and Marvel. Marvel's kind of on the way out for me anyways. I think Miles is the last book that I have and I'm going to be canceling with number 25. Not because it's a bad book, but I have honestly not read a, an issue of Miles Morales Spider-Man since issue 12 or 13. And so I'm a year behind on that. Like, why why am I going to plunk $4 a month into a book that I'm not reading? It's just not smart. Um, and somebody might say, well, it's only 4 bucks." Well, that 4 bucks could go to an indie book that I will read. Uh, same thing with Immortal Hulk. I went two years not reading that book. So it, it was, you know, two Two years times four dollars is is uh, so that's uh, twenty four books. It's ninety six dollars. You know, that's almost a hundred bucks. That's a key book that uh, that I could have picked up, or several small keys, or minor keys, or modern keys. And you know, it's just it's time to reconcile and deal with like what it is about this hobby that I really really enjoy, and. Uh, there's part of that obsessive compulsive nature that compels me to purchase stuff that I'm not reading, to, to spend money that I don't need to spend on things. And so that becomes the dynamic and the problem and the, and, uh, but it, it, it's the self-sustaining economy um, in and of itself because people are going to buy it. So I'm working on trying to lessen that impact for myself and, uh, support more indie books like The Goon, um, uh, Ultra Mega, 
Um, I'm going to be picking up Home. Um, there's some other books, uh, like Scout puts out some pretty decent books. They're hit or miss at times, but uh, I'm, I'm going to be picking up the second trade paperback of both Coyotes and Bitterroot, and then picking up the, the singles, and then trying to go back and, and collecting the, the issues that I'm missing. I think Bitterroot is at issue 12 right now, so it's not that far behind. And I think Coyotes is kind of the same thing. Um, and I have the, the big number, you know, the big bigger dollar uh, versions of the books, number one. Uh, but if anybody out there has a copy of Bitter Root number one, the Akira homage cover, and they are willing to let it go for non-eBay prices, I mean, a fair price, but non-eBay prices, please let me know. I do have some keys. I'd be willing to trade, uh, be willing to... Um, you know, give you a fair price for it. But some of these prices for, for these books are just outrageous. Um, and I think, you know, some collectors might agree. Other collectors might be like, well, it's fair, you know, pay for it. And that's the case. And if, and if I can't get it for a fair price, then that's one of those things that you just let go. I'm never going to own a 181. Um, don't really want one either, you know. So it's kind of one of those questions where like, oh, you know, you save up and you can, you can get a 181, or you can get like, you know, five or 10 other keys that are just, you know, gonna do well as well. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind. Um, I would say shop within your limits, uh, but have a mindset of, of what you're willing to do. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to pick up a book that I've wanted since I sold it. Um, and the, the book is going up in value. I don't really know why. Um, it is a it is a key book. It is a it is a good character. It's a character whose ongoing series never did that well, and it was on the verge of cancellation uh, probably about a dozen times with the writer taking pay cuts and um, instead of them either raising prices or or you know cutting cutting the you know the book entirely. Um, but fan support saved it numerous times, and it's one of those things where you kind of wonder like, how is this book this expensive? And it, uh, an individual had it at this toy show that I went to and I had just hit my 12 year, um, or not 12 year, my five year sobriety mark. And I was, I was looking at it and looking at it. And I asked, I was like, what's your bare bones price for taking that home right now? And he had it marked at 180 and he said, I'll let it go for 150. And so I looked at it, I scrutinized it. It was not in good enough condition for me to, to pay 150 for it, even though I wanted the book. So I let it go. Um, and that's just one of those things that you have to, you have to do from time to time. You have to be able to walk away. And it wasn't a tactic to get them to say, okay, you know, 125 or 100 or whatever. It, it was honestly like, I'm not going to shell out that much money for a book that's in my mind, not worth it. Um, it's kind of like people selling uh, books that are incomplete. Uh, you know, like the 180, the 181, um, the 182 with the Marvel value stamps cut out. Those are, those books are not complete and they drop way down. They would get a green label. Uh, if you tried to match it and put another, you know, stamp in place and get it modified, it'd get a purple label. Not that I'm huge on grading, um, but it's one of those things that if that book is incomplete or, you know, I, I was trying to bid on a 180 uh, at the end of 2020 or 2019, and I got one for a decent price, um, but it was one of those things where it was like, there were people trying to sell 180s for like six, $700, and um, they had the value stamp cut out. It looked like they had been, you know, somebody dropped a you know thing of soda on it they were stained they were water damaged they were rippled um and these people were like well i know what it's worth and i'm i'm like you know if, if you can get somebody to buy it for that much good on you but it you know for me i'm not going to pay that for a book that's incomplete so um that's just me i would say shop smart i i know a lot of people have saved money you know during the pandemic or or figured out ways to make money by, you know, doing shows and stuff like that. My big goal is to keep 
non-con going at least for a little bit longer. I don't know how much longer I want to do it for. Um, I have fun doing it, but it's it's not something I want to do forever. Um, I don't have a definitive stopping point, although I know what my goals are with it, and that is to fund getting both of my bathrooms renovated, and that is to um, get new gates in my backyard uh, for more security and ease of access, and to buy a new uh, dryer. And then if there's anything on top of that to have a, a, either a soundproof wall built in front of my house because I live on a main road or to have my uh, uh, my windows replaced with double pane um, for a little bit more soundproofing so I'm not woken up in the middle of the night by people driving by like crazy. Um, so those are my goals. Those, those are the end goals. I don't, I don't have aspirations of op opening up a brick and mortar comic book shop or anything along those lines. Um, I, I enjoy comics. I do like selling them. It's exciting to see what people are excited for or what people might want. Uh, it's great to have people get mail calls and um, be excited about receiving comic books because I know when I get mail calls like this, I, like half the time I forget what I purchased. Um, so it's nice to see people get excited about stuff I'm selling. Um, but most importantly, I'm excited about people getting excited about my creation, Baba Patrol. And we'll be doing that live show in two weeks, two weeks on the 8th. And it is extremely exciting because we're going to try, not try, there is no try, do or do not. Um, we're going to get the book funded. And we're going to get funding towards issue four, maybe even issue five. Uh, with the different rewards and tiers and offerings that are going to come uh, with that live show on the 8th. So um, I'll put the link in the description below for non-con. Uh, definitely tune in. I'm usually doing shows on Saturdays uh, at, um, at 7 p.m. Right now that's Pacific and selling single issues. I've got runs. Um, I'm trying to unload runs and uh, original sketch covers, taking commissions, things like that, so that we can fund this crazy dream of producing the Bubba Patrol and, you know, getting, this is, this is the Bubba Cave, the house that Bubba built, uh, and getting it in order and having it ready to go. All right, you guys take care of yourselves. Um, until my next video, I'm trying to do one of these a week and drop them on Fridays. Um, you guys uh, stay safe, mask up if you're eligible, which I believe now pretty much everybody is. Get registered, get your vaccine, and be a hero.